different kind of message this morning. I'm setting my notes aside except for the first little bit. I have three pages of notes and during praise and worship, I just, I, I don't feel that it's the Lord. You know, it may be for next week. I feel that what he has given me for the very first part is the Lord and that whether it's 15 minutes or 50 minutes, um, that I'm to go with that and a different scripture than I had in mind, which seems to have nothing to do with Christmas. So I would ask you just to bear with me and, and listen to what I believe is the heart of the Lord. And I will try to be as concise as I can. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day. And I thank you for the anointing, Lord, for it's your anointing that speaks. Lord, I humble myself before you now because you don't anoint ego. And so I humble my heart before you and say that I can do nothing apart from you. And I ask you to come and cause me to speak what you would desire to be spoken this morning and to challenge each one of us where we are. Lord, in light of this season that we're celebrating, speak truth to our hearts, Lord, and Jesus, may you be glorified and be lifted up. It's in your mighty, awesome name we pray, Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Devin, I think you have Revelation chapter 12 on the screen, and if you can change it, fine. If you can't, that's fine. It's going to be Revelation chapter 11. I want to welcome those who are watching my live stream this morning and those who will listen to the message later online. I believe that the Lord wants to show us something as we as we enter into the word this morning. And so I want to talk to you about the confronting God, the confronting God. As we come to the celebration of Christmas and we see all of the decorations and I do not personally believe that the celebration of Christmas is wrong. I first started out this week, I was going to do a historical message. I will say to those of you who have adopted an anti-Christmas message and stance, and those who believe that it is totally a conceived thing of man mixed with paganism, and certainly anything we do in church history, there is the problem of not letting pagan things get mixed in. But Christmas in itself, being pagan, does not stand the test of scrutinizing history. It cannot be proven, and it is not based upon solid review of the historical facts. It is based entirely upon the opinion of the Puritans, whom I respect highly, but who were coming out of Catholicism and were reacting not to the story of the reincarnation, I mean the incarnation, but the story, I mean the practice of mass as a Christmas thing. And then the second thing, largely the teachings that you hear concerning this come from a Scottish bishop named Alexander Hislop, who lived in the later 1800s and who wrote a paper called The Two Babylons. Now there are two Babylons and there are many things about it that are true, but in it he makes unfounded statements about the history of Christmas and about the co-opting of paganism in order to um, create this festival and this season, and it's, it cannot be based upon fact. In fact, many of the things that are brought out in that weren't even true of the early church when they were even in the 400s AD, when they were celebrating Christmas, we know for a fact they were not even using the things we use today. Christmas trees are not an old pagan thing. They are a relatively modern thing. They came about in modern history that the Christmas tree was added or was used. And it's only in part of the world, mainly the Western world. Most of the world does not even celebrate Christmas with Christmas trees. And so that is to say, it was not something adopted by the Christians from the pagans in the 400s and 300s AD. I said all of that to say that as we celebrate this wonderful season where we should be focused upon the incarnation, Christ, the word becoming flesh, that is where we're going to start this morning 
And I want to simply bring out a thought, and that is that it, at this time of year, we, are, we tend to get sentimental. As we get older, many of us remember childhood Christmas, and somehow many people wish that they could recreate that or relive that. And there is that thing called childhood wonder that makes things so exciting and so alive that can never be entirely recaptured and should not be. So there is a, a danger in trying to sentimentalize Christmas and all of the good times of childhood because the human mind, uh, the human mind selectively screens out many of the bad things of the past and remembers the good things. So we remember good things. We don't remember that there were disappointing Christmases. And we don't remember the times that somebody was fighting during Christmas when we were a kid. And all of those, we remember the good things and the excitement. And so I want to say to you this morning that we're, we're not to sentimentalize Christmas and we're not to make it syrupy sweet. We tend to think of all of the peace and goodwill towards man, which was the message of the angels to the shepherds. I usually always focus on the incarnation when I preach at Christmas time. And as we look at it, for us, for humankind, Christmas, if you really go back to its beginning in a stable, Christmas is wrapped in and shrouded in conflict and confrontation. Conflict and confrontation. And you're going to see what I mean by that in a moment. For you this morning, I don't care who you are listening to me in the sound of my voice this morning. As we think about Christmas and we begin begin to strip it of all of the stuff, Christmas confronts us. It confronts us. The only danger I find in Christmas is that we have so many trappings of Christmas that distract our mind from the confrontation of our heart. God would wrap himself in flesh. He would break through the barrier of time and space and enter into human reality with a love that is beyond any love that we've ever known. It is so intense that it cannot even be described. With sacrifice so great that he would offer himself that we sometimes would miss and not remember each time we come to this, the great confrontation that takes place when God so miraculously and so unexplicably wraps himself in flesh, but then he stands before us just as he did before Herod and or just as he did really before Pilate. And we ask the question, are you the son of God? And there is only one answer. What I'm trying to say is that you are confronted every year. You're confronted all the time. But the story of Christmas, the message of Christmas, is that you can't back down from this. You can't escape this. You can't run and hide from it. There is a message that's being proclaimed. That is that God came in a way that you cannot deny, and he stands and he faces you down in a sense, and he says, here I am in flesh and blood so that you can see what I'm like, and you can hear the story, and you can see me go to the cross. You can see the picture, the message of blood splattered on a sacrifice, and know that I am your owner and your creator. And that I have redeemed you with a price. Now, what is your life? This is the confrontation of Christmas. What is your life this morning? All around you swirl the things of Christmas and then the things of an entire year and the things of a year to come and my job and my family, my dreams, my desires, my hopes, my plans, my will, all of these things. And the Lord comes in the form of a baby to grow to be a man that you cannot escape the message 
that the Lord has come to speak truth that you cannot run from, that you cannot deny, and you are called to make not a decision, a surrender, a surrender. Every time I stand to preach a Christmas message, I usually can do one about the incarnation, and then you feel the Maybe it's the pressure. I don't know. It's not from God. It's self-imposed. But to come up with something new, how do you, how can you look at this story a little differently or bring out something that you've not brought out before? The fact is, it, fact is Christmas, just like Easter, under attack by the world and some well-meaning Christians, these two things stand as witnesses to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We dress it up in celebrations and we wrap it up with presents so that we miss the greatest present of all, the gift of the Son of God for us, first in his birth and at Easter in his death, burial, and his resurrection. All which is stating and declaring and showing forth, picturing for us ownership, that he lays claim to our lives. He lays claim to our hearts. He says, your rights are not your own rights. He says, your will is not your own will. It's given to you to choose the will of God. And he says, I have a plan and I have a purpose that's greater than anything that you could ever imagine. And it is to be directed by me so that you can be what I designed you to be before the foundation of the world. You see, he wasn't just the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He was the creator of your life before the foundation of the world. You remember in Colossians, we studied, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. By him, all things were made by him, through him, and for him. And so from the foundation of the world, he laid claim to your heart because he created your heart. And he's allowed us to run around and to live our lives. We live our lives according to our own wills. And we make plans and we go about and we mess up and we mess things up and we bring about the demise of our own purpose. We bring about conflict and all manner of things into our own life because we don't take sin seriously and we don't take the Savior seriously. We don't take seriously that even as a Christian, you become a Christian and you say, well, I stopped doing this and I stopped doing that. It's not about that. That's a fraction. I stopped cussing and drinking and I stopped going with women who did. When on the other hand, I still keep living by my own plans. I still keep making my own decisions without consulting God. I don't look to his word to be the guide for my life and for my family. I just cleaned up the outside things that everybody knows a Christian's not supposed to do. On the inside, there's a heart that still struggles with intense struggles with sin and temptation and thoughts that are not of the Lord, the flesh fights and wars against us, and the Son of God is standing before us in this season and at Easter, saying, I have come that you might lay down your burdens. I have come to give you something better. I have come to receive you unto myself. I have come to totally wash you clean and to take away all condemnation and fear and anger and all of the things that are negative in your life that damage you. And I've come to set you free from the power and the penalty of sin. And I have come to open your eyes to things you never dreamed of, to give you great revelation of who I am. I've come to unveil a life before you that you'll never know if you don't surrender your heart to me fully. I have come to confront you right where you are. That's what God does. You may look and you may see a manger with a little baby, but it's the God of the universe breaking through 
and saying, I have come and you cannot deny it. History cannot deny it. The facts bear it out. And you must decide, just like Pilate, who are you and who is he? Does he lay claim to your life? And where there's confrontation, there is also great conflict. Christmas is a conflict, a time of war. And that I will show you for just a brief moment. When Jesus was born, a warfare continued and was taken up to a higher level than it had been at any time previous, and it had been bad before that, or intense, I should say. We talked, I think it was last week, I mentioned the garden. Adam and Eve sinned, and God made a promise. First prophecy in the Bible, speaking to the woman and speaking to Satan. He said, you will have, Satan will have enmity against the woman and the seed of the woman. There will be enmity or hostility between you. And we find that that has been borne out. Warfare, as Herod sought to have all the babies killed, Uh, Pharaoh sought to have all the babies killed because a deliverer was promised and was coming forth. God was determined to preserve the bloodline that the Messiah would come through so that he would be born to undo the works of the first Adam. And when Jesus was born, Satan stirred up Herod and a repeat of the story of Pharaoh happened and The story of Moses and the babies in Bethlehem were killed, but he didn't know that Jesus had been secretly taken to Egypt and was protected. There was warfare and strategy, warfare and strategy. And you can go all the way through the Old Testament and you can see this warfare and strategy taking place. That warfare is over your life. How many times do we talk about the devil and about Satan and about demonic things? And we push that to the extremities of our thought. and We don't take seriously that every day you get out of bed, there's a warfare over your soul. And right now, even now, there are forces of darkness that truly arrange things and have a strategy of their own. Do you remember when Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit, was baptized. And then it said that the Holy Spirit led him out into the wilderness for a trial to test him. And it wasn't to see him fail, it was to prove who he was, to prove the power of the Holy Spirit in his life and that he was the Son of God. And when he passed the three tests, then it said that he went in the power of the Spirit And Satan left him for a season until a more opportune time. That word opportune, time, in the Greek is the word kairos, kairos time. It's not time as in years rolling by. It's not time as in the time on a clock. It's strategic time. Satan left him for a more strategic time. And every time you get some victory in your life over the enemy of your soul, he simply retreats until a more strategic time. And he knows when those strategic times are in your life, when perhaps you're worn down and you're weak spiritually. You're not in the word, and so you're not prepared. You're not thinking on the things of God, and so you have no discernment to see what the enemy's doing in your life. Now, all glory in your life is to be given to the Lord first, and we don't ever want to glorify Satan by giving him too much credit. But at the same time, you know, people say about certain Christian groups, oh, they see a demon behind every bush. There is one. (laughs) There's at least one in every house. If you don't believe it, be there on Sunday morning, right? 
There's one to stir up something all the time and there's one always lurking to tempt you or to discourage you or lie to you or say you're not worthy enough or to tell you that you'll never make it or to tell you that God must not really love you. Why didn't he answer my prayer or all of these different things that he will throw at you and you may not be willing to accept that it is the enemy of your soul, but that is his strategy is that you would not see it for what it is. At Christmas, we celebrate this baby and we celebrate there were angels out singing in the field. They weren't, doesn't say they sang. I think it was more of a shout of power. It says that the the angelic host, which is the army of heaven, appeared to the angels and they began to declare things. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill towards man. It wasn't a sweet choir. It was the voice of warfare. It was the voice of victory that God had come, and he had disguised himself in a baby, but he was coming for the salvation of mankind. And when he comes to the cross, there's no escaping that. There's no escaping the reality of one who looks like you, if you will, who has flesh like you, who did not have to, who chose to come and to confront your life, but who came wrapped in a way that we wouldn't expect and yet comes with such intense love that man has never known that kind of love. Maybe I see this today as time is going by. I think hearts are really getting hard even in the church, I have to fight against it, that I would stay tender towards these things, that that it wouldn't just be an old thing, that, yeah, I know God loves us with an, an intense love. No, I need to feel it. I need to understand that the the vacuum in the human heart is a vacuum that longs for love. How many people have run headlong into sin and destroyed their lives? When it all came out, they just weren't loved. They didn't know what love was, and they were just just set upon self-destruction. We can say it sounds sweet and all of these things, but the truth is that every human being needs to be loved, and they can't even fathom the kind of love that God brings. And so he comes and he confronts us, and he says, you can't escape this. You can try to hide from it, but the reality is I've come. I've come, and I've come in power, and I've come in glory. I've come in warfare. I've come, and I've confront your life. What are you going to do with the truth that I'm bringing? That's what Christmas morning is. Every present that's open is just some weak symbol of the great gift that God has given to mankind. He says, all good gifts come from the Father above. And so he comes, let me, let me just do this in Revelation chapter 11. And here I have to make a disclaimer or some of you will say, oh, Pastor Mark, that was, that was not sound biblical interpretation and that was bordered on heresy. In chapter 11, we read about the two witnesses that are going to stand in the streets of Jerusalem and are going to preach the gospel until they are killed by Antichrist forces and then resurrected and ascend into heaven. And there are all manner of interpretations of this. I'm not interpreting it. I want to use it as an illustration. So I'm not taking away from whatever you have studied and whatever interpretation you have. The two witnesses may well be, and I tend to believe they are, two men who stand in the streets of Jerusalem according to the word of God and who preach the everlasting gospel. But Revelation is filled with signs and symbols, and they could be the church, the Hebrew, the Messianic church, or those who have come in from Israel, and those who are grafted in, which we are, the two witnesses who proclaim the gospel and who are the target of persecution throughout history. So there there are a variety of interpretations that aren't heresy, but are just different. 
But I want to just show you something from the principles in it. I want you to see something in it. So in chapter 11, then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy, which means preach the truth of the word of God. And they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. And I believe that if they are two men, they are Moses and Elijah, as we will see. These are the two olive trees he's borrowing here from Zechariah's vision. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. In other words, the olive trees are the source of the oil. Here is the source of the flow of the anointing and the candlestick is its power displayed as it gives forth light. Here are two that are receiving their receptacles of the anointing of God and they're giving forth light with such intensity and power that all of those who hate God hate them. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. Whoa. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have, this is why Moses and Elijah, these have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Here is a world that has gone headlong into following the beast, the Antichrist, hating Christians and the message of God, and they're confronted again with a manifestation of God's power that cannot be denied. There in the streets of Jerusalem, we see one who can shut the heavens up so that it doesn't rain, Elijah, and one who can turn water to blood as Moses did. And they're called the two witnesses. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. It says the same thing about what he has done and does do against believers. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the people's tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into the graves. This warfare gets intense in the last days. We stand in the very brink of that hour where we see hostility rising and we see just absolute mockery. I don't know if any of you saw this week the Turkish government official that was speaking before uh, some governmental body, and he was uh, a Muslim, and he began to lamb blast Israel and those who were there who, who were um, Israeli. And he, he called upon Allah, basically, and he said, you, speaking of Israel, said, you will not be able to escape the wrath of Allah. And he went on and on about how they would be destroyed by Allah, how they would be wiped out. And instantly he dropped and fell to the floor and hit his head with a massive heart attack. Pretty amazing. The Bible says that we're not to come against Israel. But I say all that to say there's warfare in the heavens. Everything you see being manifest on earth, there's a raging warfare. It's over your soul. It's over the churches and it's over the nations and it's over the gospel. God is the one who is always victorious. He will win. It's no contest. He's displaying his power and he will bring forth 
these things that we see in the book of Revelation, and he will continue to deal with hardened hearts until every last effort has been made to save everyone who will come to the knowledge of the truth. You're confronted with these things. You're confronted this time of year. You're confronted with an infant in a stable that stinks and smells and people say he's God. You're confronted with one who said that you must love me more than mother or father, sister or brother, houses or land. You're confronted with one who says, if you love me, follow me. You're confronted with one who says that in order to follow me, you must take up your cross daily. Count the cost. Follow me if you would be my disciple. You're confronted by one who says, I have all authority in heaven and on earth. Christmas is not decorations. There's nothing wrong with some celebration, with some decoration, but when you compare it, When you compare it to what's really taking place, they're just cheap little gaudy trinkets compared to the revelation of who Christ is. We stand and we see him confronting the world. I am the light of the world. And I've always, not always, for years, and I've mentioned it, but I've never really preached on it. But even though I believe these to be exactly as the scripture says, They are, I find that scripture is so filled with layers of meaning. It says, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Let me just ask you a question. Do you think that we, the Christians, do you think we, those who have this message, You know, I believe it's two men, but let me just say this concerning the church. The church has the same authority in Christ's name to do what they're doing under the direction of God, not of our own thoughts. But as the Lord leads, the church has the same authority given by Christ to perform miracles and to declare curses and blessings and all of these things. Do you think that you and I and the church willingly torment the people of the earth? Is it our goal to torment those around us? No, but the message of Christ torments the hardened heart. That's why they get so enraged. It's not even rational. Any other religion can stand in the room and say anything it wants to, but let a Christian speak and they go crazy. They go nuts. Because it's exclusive. Because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And it says here that these two men, these two men and what they were doing in their message, it says they tormented those who dwell on the earth. That wasn't their goal. It wasn't their goal to torment. Their goal was to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ that repentance might take place. And I think it's kind of interesting that there are two witnesses that have been with us since the early history of the church that aren't people, but days. The witness of Easter, and I'm calling it Easter because the anti-Easter people say Easter is a pagan word. And I'm just not cowing to that, cowering to that. We call it Resurrection Sunday here. Easter declares the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Christmas declares the birth in human form of the Almighty Son of God. The gospel is proclaimed through two witnesses throughout history, Easter and Christmas. Every year, twice a year, we get it. Christmas and Easter, all those people only go to church on Easter. Well, at least they get the gospel then. Christmas and Easter. But you notice that the people of the world hated the message. The Antichrist hates the message and put them to death. 
It's always fascinated, fascinated me that the people let them lay, lay in the streets dead. They rejoiced over it. And then they gave gifts to each other. That's what Christmas is without surrender to the true message of the gospel. It's a dead thing laying in the street. It's just an empty tradition and a ritual. It's just a human celebration that has no life unless God breathes upon it. And so we see from time to time the people around us in the world trying to get rid of every public display of Christmas to outlaw nativity scenes, to do all these things. And yet every Christmas, the majority of them having fully commercialized Christmas, they are giving gifts and laughing and celebrating all the time. Same people who seek to destroy the message. And they lay in the streets and yet they celebrated. They sent gifts to one another. The celebrating continued while they thought the message was dead. They celebrated while they thought the message was dead. That's an end time scenario. They celebrated while they thought the message was dead. After three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and great fear fell on all those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them, which is exactly what's going to happen to you and I. When he comes, we're going to ascend and the enemies are going to see us. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. And in one sense, every one of these things that you read tells the same truth over and over again in a different way. For I was going to preach in chapter 12 today about the dragon who stood ready to devour the male child when it was born. Same story in a different form. This morning, the Lord wants to open your heart up. He wants you to be bare before him. You know, Adam and Eve were naked before the Lord and there was no shame because they were pure before him. And when sin came, then they hid. You as a Christian and you who may listen to me on the internet, how much of your heart do you try to hide from God and what good do you think it does? What is your life in the light of such a confrontation as this? God breaking through the barrier between time and space and this reality and coming and saying, I lay claim to your life. I lay claim to your soul. I lay claim to your plans. I lay claim to your family. I lay claim to your behavior in the workplace. I lay claim to your future and your finances. I lay claim to every breath that you take. And I say that I am your salvation. It's the words of the Lord. I am the one who opens the door. I am the gate of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the light, the truth and the way. What will you do this Christmas? I don't know if you'll remember this message or not. It's not some great oratorial gift to you. But I pray that if there's something lurking in your heart, 
that you've not surrendered to the Lord. I pray that if you're not the Christian that maybe even people think you are at the church, I pray that if you have things that are unresolved in your heart that God wants to deal with, that you wouldn't be able to get up on Sunday morning and just have a fun time with the family about presents and gifts if you've not had an honest heart-to-heart with the Lord about the great gifts that he has given to you and what you have done with it. I pray that you yield That is what Christmas is about. I pray that you will yield because one has come into the world who calls for us to yield, to surrender, and promises something that we could never otherwise have. I pray that when Christmas comes, that if you're a family, if you were parents, that before your children, they will see in you the character of Christ being formed that they will see in you that their family is being led by one who loves God above all else, that your family will see in you one who's willing to lead according to the word of God, and your family will see in you a person who believes in miracles and in the sustaining power of God, who prays until prayer is answered. I pray that the testimony of Christ would be real in your life. In chapter 13 or 12, where we did not go, it says that those who believed overcame the enemy. They overcame him by the power of the blood and by the word of their testimony and that they did not love their lives even to the death. It's the same today. To overcome the enemy as he tries to keep you ensnared is to depend upon the blood of Jesus Christ that is sufficient to save, to heal, and to deliver you. To claim and believe, lay claim to the power that is in that blood and the promises that are given to those who believe. To have a testimony by the word of their testimony, not their testimony that they accepted Jesus when they were 10, their ongoing testimony of the Lord in their life and what he's doing, what he's saying, what he's speaking, that they have a fresh word to address what's taking place in their life at that moment. And most of all, that they did not love their lives even to the death. That we're willing to lay down our will, our lives for the one who loved us and who's worthy above all else to receive a life that honors him. Amen. Father, I've given what I believe you wanted me to say, and I ask, Lord, that you would take this, speak to some heart, that fruit might be born in their lives, Lord God. May you, this Christmas, be glorified in every household as King of all and Lord of all to the glory of God the Father. In Jesus' name. Amen.